Okay. Let's see. Oh, the, nope, damn it. All right. Uh, I think we are good to go. Sweet. All right. So, um, let's jump up the minutes. So, Sakshan, um, what did you want to talk about today? Uh, so you opened this issue last week. I was not in the meeting. I was a little busy. Nine zero seven. Oh, yeah. So what do you mean by uh, this? Uh, what is minus one and one two nine six? Uh, should I oh. uh, explain what is happening here? Yes. Is it something we're, like that? people were not sure what view was? Okay, okay, okay. So I'll add a comment. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's just add something that explains what's going on there, and so let's go take a. Uh, look at the um, look at the and editorial. the second part of the issue uh, should we really create a new uh, a I new mean, uh, or do it in this one right you could just show one of the layers as a sequential uh, layer right or... yeah I can so I can give an example of a sequential layer in, in short yeah or yeah yeah you can just do it yeah um just make sure, make just sure it's something that somebody yeah. could have as a full example right so if i wanted to change this conv three into you know like um a sequential layer. yeah right to to like you could have two conv together right is what you're saying as a sequential layer uh we can have like it, uh, the sequential layer stuff i added is just for a little more um, speed process like we don't then if there are sequential layers right so if there are three sequential layers uh, like block one block two block three we don't we won't have to specify the forward method here oh okay yeah okay yeah well let's just give 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 a full enough example that somebody could run it you know that that they wouldn't have to make any guess modifications right yes yeah, so I might have added an ex uh, very extra small features here that <laughs> need explaining. Yeah, I was okay. learning at that time. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I that everyone used every type of thing. Yeah, yep, yep. Well, and I think it'll be good, right? So somebody was interested enough to 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 want to to want to know what was going on, right? So, um, so yeah, let's just make sure we have a, a, some kind of example for that, um, and then. Um, yeah, so, and then the view, right? So what's what's going on with view, right? Because it's not... You know, so it's, view just changes the, uh, like, if there is a tensor, it just interprets the tensor, uh, like we've given minus 1 and 1 to 9, 6. Uh -huh. So 1 to 9, 6 is the, I think it's the number of, uh, it's the batches into the, into the out channels, uh, into the out channels, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. last convolution there. Uh huh. And so, okay. Well, wait that a minute. Side. There's linears in features is one two nine six, and then so from, when it comes uh, from the last the third convolutional layer, yeah, there are sixteen channels. Yep. And the size uh, and uh, it's it's like uh, yeah yeah. So now I remember it's batch size into the number of channels into the dimensions of the image okay okay oh and that's why okay and so just okay. like and then we don't have to specify in features enough okay yeah and then so what's the negative one then like uh like uh it's uh i think we've uh, you've seen that in the numpy examples too right minus one just flattens it yeah oh okay cool Cool. Yeah, so let's just make sure that we have something that talks about each of those things, right? Um, cause I think, okay. Yeah, because if this is not something, unless, because the main thing was it doesn't appear up here, right? And um, yeah, it doesn't appear up here. And anything that appears up here, they can go look on up on the PyTorch website, which actually may need to be made clear as well. Um, but, I'll, add, I'll add links to yeah. the documentation yeah. of PyTorch. Cool, cool. Um, so let's see. It's just note. Um, might be or would be helpful to add links 
to the PyTorch documentation. Watching in Gitter chat, someone was getting an error. I don't know how was he getting that error. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to take a look at that one yet. Yeah. Um, let's see. So it would be helpful to add links in the PyTorch documentation so that um, users know where to go for more information on each uh, yeah, layer. Yeah, each layer. Okay. Um, okay. So, all right. Um, so, oops. Whoa. Okay. Um, all right. Anything else you wanted to talk about? Yeah. So I was, I told you the model was working now using DFML. All right. right. So like how was, uh, I asked you a question like, uh, uh, how would we connect ah, the right. number of content? Using, okay. Yeah. So we'll take a look at that then. Um, let's do, let's just get some other stuff down first and then we'll do that. Okay. Um, okay. So let's just put the context capacity. Yeah. Need to specify context capacity from command line. Okay. Okay. So. Oh, and then the other thing was that we created a new issue to say that uh, the layers should have the out channel set to the previous in channels. Or let's see, yeah, the in channel should be set to the previous out channels if that's a thing. Okay. Is that, does that, yeah, do you agree so with I, that? Or? Yeah, I wanted, I was looking at that at the time, but uh, I was not able to find a workaround for that. I guess someone else is working on it now. I saw there was a comment on that issue. Yeah, I think, yeah, I saw that. So um, actually, I think I was trying to get back to them too. Yeah, I have a unfinished comment to them. Um, all right, so. All right. Um, that's great. a good idea, right? Yeah, okay. That's a good idea. Cool. Glad, glad, you, glad you think so. So, um, all right. Um, all right, so. And let's show. Uh, so, okay. So, Shaw, how have things been going for you? Uh, things have been pretty good, actually. Um, I finished tra uh, training the model, uh, and it works. So, I'm on my way to writing the test cases right now. All right, great. Uh, There's just a couple of things I want to ask you. Uh, the first thing is that uh, usually when a user is using a DFFML, they have to have three sets, right? One is a training set, one is the sort of the validation set in which uh, they'll give some data to test the accuracy of the model, and mm -hmm. one is the data they'd like to predict on. Mm -hmm. And what would, and I wanted to know if there was a way to sort of take in the training and validation sets simultaneously, because what I'm doing right now is I'm cutting off a portion of the training set and using it as the validation set. And while that works okay, in smaller data sets, the loss of data, the loss of training data turns out to be critical and decreases the accuracy. So yeah. I was thinking that if we already have a validation set, why not use that instead of uh, like cutting off a portion of the training set? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think this is this is something that obviously and we're, we're we're trying to figure out. We've gone back and forth on the on this stuff with uh, actually in training um, and what what to do here. Um, this is a semi related issue, um, but I think that um, and and Sakshom, you can have some more input on this, but I think that we should probably yeah so there's we should probably hmm, let's see so if you it, i guess yeah, what like, can you show like, us what like, you're doing like, exactly yeah yeah absolutely absolutely like uh, this issue makes sense right because if you if we took in data uh, in one go like apart from the test set we took in training and uh, training and validation sets in one go and gave a sort of config parameter to allow the user to split the data uh, as they desired. I think uh, it would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, a, so that should be, I mean, that should be pretty easy to do. So right now the way that it works is, um, let's see. Yeah. The way that it works right now is you can basically specify all of the data that you want to, um, so any sources that you list get combined together. Um, so they all go based off the same um, key. Um, so basically, like if you had rows in a CSV file, unless you explicitly keyed them, they would be just keyed off like from, from zero to N. Um, so if you wanted to give multiple data sources, you'd just add them, you'd just, uh, you'd, you'd string them together. So I can, why don't we do an example here? So, um, That's a good example. Uh, we'll just do, you know, one of these ones. So, okay. No, uh, actually, I still don't understand uh, what uh, he's talking about exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe it would be I'll good if you show us yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll present my screen and give an example. Yeah. That way we're all on the same page. That's a good plan. Uh, right. Is my screen visible? Um, not yet. It says presentation, but it's not showing anything. Uh, right. Thanks, baby. I love you. All right. Now, uh, I, now I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm talking about is like right here in train, I have this parameter K that sort of signifies the portion of the training set I want to use explicitly for training. And I've set it to 0.7 right now. Uh, what we'd, what would be ideal is if I had the validation set right here so that I would not have to make that uh, make this split a split from the training set and not train on that 30% of data. So in accuracy, we are not training; we're just testing, right? So let's yeah, let's see the rest uh, of your code here. So scroll yeah. down just a little bit so we can see the whole train model. So I see you have your yeah. x val, so x val y val. Okay, x. Okay, now keep going. So keep going here. Right. So the point basically is I do not train on the validation set. I just use it to sort of set a hyperparameter epsilon and that's literally its own use. And then we have accuracy. So let's see. So what I'd like to do is uh, to have validation set as an input somewhere uh, here in the train method so that I can use that instead of cutting off a portion from the training set. It's yeah. fine. Uh, 
this is mostly a problem with small data sets like uh, data sets with like 300 to 400 uh, examples mm-hmm. if you have like bigger comparatively bigger like 10000 plus examples i don't think it should be a problem so i guess my my question here is is what so can you scroll down to your your code that that uh, basically puts stuff in storage um uh, yeah Okay, so just to make Gaussian. Okay, so and where is so y val, x val, and y val? Where did you split those off again? Uh, it's I guess we need to go up just a little bit. Yeah. Okay, reshape. And of y val. Oh, okay, split. Okay, I see. Yeah. So, and then XVAL, YVAL, PVAL, F1 final. Okay, so why do these need to be calculated here, I guess? So what does this give you? So when you go down, what's, what's can I see predict? Uh, yeah, sure. Like, uh, what you really want to know is why am I splitting the training set? Uh, in well, why? Parts, yeah. Right? So the question is, why can't it be in accuracy and predict, or why can't we have it in train and accuracy? Why does it have to both be in in train? Yeah. So the thing is, um, how the model works is it uses it sort of predicts an hyperparameter from the data itself. So it uses a part of the data to sort of set a hyperparameter epsilon, which it then uses to make predictions. So either way, I need some, some part of the data to sort of set that hyperparameter, which is so, why I need. So from what I understand is you want like you are you have uh, two data sets here. Uh, like one is the training data set and one is the validation data set and you want both of them to go to the train method, right? Yep. So you can, uh, so as John said, you can just pass the two, uh, the two things together. Yeah. So I think there is going to be a slight, slight difference here in that. Um, all right. So we'll do, we'll take a stab at this. Um, let me just, so. Yeah, I see what you're. I see what you're asking for. Um, I think that we should have a way to do this. I'm not sure. I think yeah, we'll 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 make sure that we have a way to do this. Um, and I think that this becomes so. So this becomes one of those things where, um, you know, part of the goal here is to um, sort of one of the overarching goals with the FFML is to make sure that things are are you know usages are standardized across models, right? Um, so this is this introduces a uh, you know a different case where you have to add your test data to your training data, right? Um, exactly. And so um, and and it sounds like that's I mean this I'm not um, yeah so it sounds like what you what you're saying yeah, is that that's a requirement yeah. of your model. So so if that if that's, that's a requirement, not, that's not a requirement. That's not a like hard requirement. Like the model still works pretty well. Uh, I'm getting like an F1 score of 0.8 right now. If I do not use the validation set, if I use it, I'm getting a F1 score of 0.875. So, so you just want more data? N- yeah. Okay. So why can't okay. you train the model twice? Like retrain the model or something? I mean, I guess in just. Retrain the- yeah, so basically, like train, like you know, like you have some save save state, and then you you um, so you have your saved F one state. You train it again using more data, right? You have an existing model. You train the model. You have a you know less. Le- you have just just the training data. Then you train the model again, and now you've 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 added the test data to the train data effectively, right? Is there a way to do that to to um, to basically just you know to do another round of training and improve the F1, or do you have to do the whole data set at once, in in one pass? Uh, I mean we could do something like a k-fold cross validation that would give us in essence probably a bit more data and 
the accuracy would be slightly better as well. And All then right. we could try that. I'm just, I'm more just posing that as an idea for, you know, the fact that, that you're saying you need the whole data set to do this, right? Um, you know, it sounds like you're just, you're really saying that you're getting better accuracy because you have a larger data set, right? But it, I, uh, it else. No. What I'm saying is uh, normally when a user uh, supplies data, the standard format is you supply some training data, then you have data which tests your accuracy, um, which is essentially the validation set data. And the third is the data you want to predict on, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, uh, would it be possible to have the validation set data and the training data supplied to the train method in one go? Yeah, I guess so. Yes, I'm. I'm, and I'm saying, I'm saying yes. It's so. I just want to make sure that we're 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 just looking at this from the right angle here, right? So, so you're you're. It's giving you. I mean, the effect of the effect of this is that you have a bigger um, test data set, right? That's that's the end effect, essentially, right? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. open source project. I just. Hello. I think we have a we have somebody new in the in the in the call. So, can you uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, let me decide. Uh, I'm from. Just a minute. Hello, am hey. I audible to you? Yes. Yeah. So Nitesh, Nitesh Yadav, this side, and uh, I'm from India, and I'm a MSc Computer Science student from University of Delhi. And yeah, I really uh, looking forward to contribute to the DFML. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Nitesh. Um, did I say that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Nitesh, okay. Um, and I'm John, and we've got Saksham and, and Shah on the on the phone here, and Shah is taking us through uh, anomaly detection model right now. So we'll we'll jump back into your, um, we'll, we'll circle back with you in, in a minute here, and, and uh, we'll ask for your agenda items, and, and we'll continue on with our meeting. But I just want to make sure we, we, uh, we introduce you to everybody, so... Cool. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Good. All right. So yeah. So um. All right. You know, we'll just. I think. I think we've uh, we've debated this for for we've we've talked about this for long enough. So we'll just jump in and we'll we'll figure out how to. I muted myself in the middle of talking. All right. So we'll figure out how to um, um, give you uh, both both data sets. So here, I'll start sharing and. Um, and we can we can just get going on this. So, um, all right. So, and let me know. So, is this can can you guys everybody is this too small of text for anybody or can everybody see this? Okay. Does anybody want the text bigger? All right. Let me know if, if, if it looks too small. Um, so let's go through um, just the quick start and see see about this. So all right, so we've got our test data set and our training data set, um, and so we have this issue here from a long time ago um, where we talked about, you know, uh, if we had basically one, this is the reverse of this situation, basically, is this issue where we have one data set um, and um, we want to do, we want to use part of that data set during a train command and part of that data set during an accuracy command. So with this case, we want to use both and as part of the um, as a part of the train command. So I think, you know, what we're just going to do here is we're going to try listing things. Um, well, because well, we know how this is going to end up. But um, so basically right now, all of the all of the sources should be combined into one data set, right? So we should end up with basically an override here where one of these, um, since this is row zero and this is row one, this is row zero and this is row one, it's going to merge sources in both data sets. Um, 
and we should end up with basically just four rows still, right? But we want is six rows. So, um, so one equals CSV and two equals CSV. Now we get a source one file name. So test source two file name um, training and you know, we only end up with oh we only end up with the first right because we're only going to iterate over the first okay so all right um, i think that that the other issue that's related to this is the um uh sources so Oh, so I thought it added, uh, it appended that to the other. Yeah, it used to append it, um, and then we changed it at some point. Uh, I can't remember when that was, but we changed it to, oh, okay, to okay. merge it. Um, so basically what we need is we have another issue that talks about, um, yeah, this one, established way to pass arguments to subclasses of list slash collections user list. Um, so because what our current yeah this and we were talking about this back in march and i think this is what led you into um doing the unified config stuff so i think this is sort of one of our last mile things there um so basically we had this large effort that sakshan went through and, and changed the way the configuration works throughout the code base um to um to be based on those config classes right because we're trying to get closer and closer to um a quote unquote unified config approach um which is basically every every class and object throughout dffml gets configured the same way so that we can accept inputs from the command line or from wherever um you know in a json blob or or python um in the same way um so part of what's going on here is right so we have when we're looking at and let's see this command here um i wonder if we can do Submit plus x or minus x. I wonder if this will. All right, great. So when we run this command here, this list records, right? We're doing sources. Um, uh, so we're we're specifying sources, right? So if we want to figure out what's going on there, we'd go in dfml source source, right? Um, and we're looking at this sources class. Um, so this is the thing that we're instantiating here right and when we're instantiating it we're passing it these two arguments and then these are the um this is how we're passing arguments to the sub sources right so this this sources class holds two instances of a base source so this is singleton equals base source um so singleton like this is the the single thing like if you look at one of the elements what is it what is the class the type of the class that it is well it's a base source um which is also in this file um uh that's yeah so base source context this is record record update and then here's base source um so we're instantiating two of them right so first one is of type it's a csv source and the second one is also a csv source then we say okay source one file name so for the source that we're instantiating source that's with the tag or label one um the file name for it is test and source with the, the label two the file name for it is training um so then we end up merging the two of them right now with the current implementation um and that happens let's see so where is that yeah sources so when we do the record so a source has three methods basically it has update records and record right and and so everything in dffml is based on a unique key um so that we can combine across sources and stuff like that uh, easily so um so um basically update updates one record um records grabs all the records in a source and record grabs a single record by its unique key um <clears throat> so in this case what we're doing is we did the records basically when we list all the records we're, we're effectively calling this records method on this sources context um and so basically we are uh, everything's context managed and uh and we actually have two context managers for every object and that's sort of the paradigm that we're using and that you can read 
If you're not familiar with that, you can read about that under the contributing documentation. I think it's under like one, two punch or something. Um, so basically we create the sources or we create this sources object. And then from that, we create sources context. And then within that, we, we're calling this records method. Um, and I'll pull that up here so you can see that too. So, um, so diff mel uh, CLI CLI. Um, So I'm do list, yeah. Okay, list records. All right, so here it is. So async with sources as sources. So async with sources as sources context. And then, so async for record in records, right? So that's, now we're calling this method. Um, and then we have the pretty printing stuff here. So, um, and yeah, uh, but that's not really important right now. So, <clears throat> all right. So what we're interested in here is the fact that um, we need a way. So right now it goes through for, for each source um, in itself. Um, so basically, and it breaks on the first one. So it's going through the first, it's going through each source and it's merging them with all the other sources, right? So this is basically, um, I swear we have an issue for this. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, so this this is the issue where we're silently merging things. So this is basically the, the issue that we're looking at right now. Um, so we changed it. When did we change it? Um, yeah, well, I don't know. Um, but yeah, we changed this, I guess, in January. And we made it so that for, for some reason we, we realized, you know, well, the intended behavior here was that we needed to merge with every other record, right? So you could specify multiple, um, I think it was, for example, with the image source or something, um, you know, we had the, you may have the image data, an actual um, image file um, through the directory source, and then you may have, you know, some, some metadata about the image um, that's not just the raw image data in like a CSV file or something. Um, I think that might have been the original use case, but... Anyway, so basically what we need to do is we need to be able to say um, that we don't want to merge the sources, right? So we want to basically say, um, uh, in this case, we want to say, let's see, yeah, so we go through, we're grabbing the first source, and then we grab the other sources, and we merge the record, and then we yield it, right? So we basically want... Um, Oh, this is in a different directory, isn't it? Okay, so let's see. Right, so let's see, do we, yeah, so now we, we want this behavior, right, where we're getting all of the records, right? Sure. Uh, right. Okay. So yeah. So really, that's that's the goal here. Um, so we need some kind of um, we need some kind of parameter that we can pass. Um, we need we need Maybe to be able to config. Yeah, we need to be able to configure this sources class in some way, right? So. And this thing doesn't have a config object, so that's kind of the, the first thing here. So um, sources config. Um, oops, space source. All right, so we need something like this, right, where we can now configure it um, using the named com so the named parameters that we were using here, right? So this file name is something that we'd usually get from a, a config object like this, right? Where it would be file name, and then string, right? So we need okay. something that's like, you know, merge. <laughs> so, and it should be a pool um, and it should default to, um, I guess, well, okay. This is the other thing is that um, part of doing um, these 
command line flags, making things um, part of the fact that we have this unified config thing is that when we end up with command line flags, um, you know, you kind of want to do when you have a booling, you usually want to do something that ends up being, um, you know, a, a, a specify basically. So if we had merge and if defaulted to false, then we'd have to say merge. Um, or if it defaulted to true, then we'd have to say merge off or something, right? Um, whereas if since the merge command defaults to, um, uh, since we'd want, with the default is that it should merge, then if we specified no merge, then we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to give it anything. It would just say, you know, no merge. And this is part of thinking about like, okay, things going to end up on the command line. So, uh, you know, if you have a command line flag, you usually, that's a booling. You usually just want to specify it, right? You don't really want to give it another, there's no need to say anything after it, right? So we might say no merge. Um, what will be the use case for doing a merge when passing two sources? Um, well, I think it was like like I was saying, you know, if you have, say that you have the directory source with images and then you have the, um, or you have some data in a CSV file and you have some data in um, a database, um, and then you you wanted to, you know, you you wanted to combine them based on the same key. I guess we could just make it right. merge. Right. 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 Is, yeah, yeah. I mean, so currently that's the default behavior, right? Um, default should be merge, right, right, right. Yeah. So I think I think that that's usually you know, yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's an argument to be made for either way, but we have it right now as the default. So if we're going to change it, let's uh, let's let's leave it as is and let's change it later, right? So, so no merge equals false. So, um, so, cause we can always, yeah, we can always go in and change it later. So no config. So this is how we use it, right? So we'd say, okay, self dot parent. So within a context, you need to reach into the parent and you grab the config object and you check for no merge. Um, so if self dot config dot parent, no merge. Um, and I believe we want not no merge. So no merge equals false. Now this creates a bit of an awkward syntax, but the end user sees the right thing. So, um, okay. So if not self dot 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 no merge, then we break. So let's just see how this ends up. Um, I'm not sure if this will explode on us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sources object has no attribute config. Yeah, so this may explode on us here. Um, hmm. Async, async context manager list. Let's go check out that. Um, so, async helper. Yeah, I want to see if we can just do this right here because this has been an issue for obviously a year now. So let's see if we can get it. Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Context manager list, user list. Um, and then what is the instantiation on this? So init args. So yeah, I think there's there might be too much heavy lifting to do in this meeting right now. Um, but this is the start at it. So basically the next thing is that, and you can, you can, you can explore doing this yourself. Um, but it may get a little tricky. Um, this may be, it may be, um, something that you, you, yeah, you may, you may be able to do this. You may not, um, you know, without a significant amount yeah. of effort. Um, I, I'd be willing to try. Okay. To try yeah. Topic. Might as well. Right. You know? Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. yeah. So I think the, the first thing is that, okay, so let's do a diff here so you can see. So basically the first thing is that we needed to add this config here, right? So, um, sources has no attribute config and let's just, let's just make sure that this does the right thing. Um, 
just uh, so that this we we know that this will do the right thing because we're going to make this two commits. So self dot parent dot config equals sources config. So when the object is instantiated, we're going to need to make sure that it has this config, right? Okay, so if oh did we do wait a minute no merge okay yeah so this is why this is why it's important to test this okay so sources config oh and then no merge equals true okay yeah so that gives us the behavior that we want if no merge is true right which is what we did here then now we have the behavior we want so so this is the correct patch then um, provided we can pass config or provided so this would be the correct patch for to implement this if we had um let's see where was it um this issue complete right so um because this is so what is this Add configuration parameters to sources to toggle combination. Okay, now this is this is the correct patch for this, right? So, um, okay, yeah. So I'll paste this in here. So the key is figuring out. How do we fix this issue, right? So this one is basically solved by this patch. Right, um, and then you know, updating documentation appropriately. Um, but I'm not sure if there is much documentation for this, so um, might be creating documentation. So let me just make a note here. Um, so in 2020, 12 01 meeting, uh, we uh, let's see, we found that this is the correct uh, fix um, so and let's give an example uh, for an example uh, try the quick start tutorial um, uh, using tr test and training data sets um, then do uh, with the no merge uh, flag added to not merge records. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, and then we'll paste this in here, and then this will be so. You'll, you'll know things have gone well when when this um, right when this starts doing what what it's supposed to do when we hard code it in the, the instantiation of the config class right um, so let's see yeah great so now this this leaves and we'll just put the, this is dependent on or do we already have the yeah so this is dependent on Okay, so um, yeah, and so this is the main thing, right? And so if we get into, and now I'm just going to do, um, I'll just get stash, All right? So now looking at this code <clears throat> in here, right? So this is or let me pull up this again, because that's probably going to be helpful. But, so, vim dfml source, source, right? So this is, this is the sources context class, right? Where we just did that patch. Um, and, we, you know, we gave this sources class a config. And so usually what happens is that for objects, so for objects that derive from everything derives from this, the base classes in this in this file. So, for objects that derive from where to go, uh, it should be base 
base config, base configurable. Um, okay. Yes. So basically, this is the yeah base configurable meta class um, and base configurable. So everything in DFFML, all classes derive from base conf configurable, or they should, um, but not if they're this uh, list class, right? Um, because that's that derives from the user list, which is basically you know a user defined list type in Python. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a wrapper that they added to the collections module. Um, so pi collections. So it's this module if you wanted more information and user list. Um, and so this is something that um, it's not, it's, you can read all about it and, and why it was added and everything here. But um, this is essentially, you know, that's what we're wrapping here. Um, we're subclassing from that, right? And then because everything in DFML follows this, uh, one to um, context entry pattern where we do async um, with and then async with again, right? So we hit two A inter blocks. Um, and if you're not familiar with context management, um, then uh, pi with statement. Um, so I would check out just, I would check out maybe, yeah, context lib might be a good place. Um, let's see, with statement or this is really not a great i hate it when they explain things like this um let's see yeah okay mm. yeah okay this is kind of yeah this is exactly what it is so basically there's an enter and an exit method on things and when you do a with statement this is basically it it's basically this try accept block where you would um Let's see. Yes, you do enter. You enter the context manager by calling the enter method, and then on the finally you exit. Um, and yeah, you can do some things where you don't raise exceptions to, but um, that's not the intent of any of these context managers. So, um, and then this context lib is another great place to learn about you know all of this context management and context manager helpers and stuff that they have done in the standard library to make it easier to use context managers. Um, but the reason why we use context managers everywhere is because they ensure that um, if we have issue or any exceptions that are caught within the width or any exceptions that are thrown within the width blocks anywhere um, get cleaned up correctly. So um, anybody, is there any questions on that at all uh, for anybody who hasn't um, had anybody? All right, okay. So, uh, right. so I'll try and see if I can uh, solve this issue. Uh, in the meantime, uh, should I still continue with the test cases? Um, sorry. With the yeah, test so cases. continue uh, with the test cases, right? So I would say, yeah, continue with the test cases. Don't worry about, and let's just write this in the meeting minutes for you. So we all, we have a record here. Um, okay, so um, would like to be able to use, uh, give both training and test data uh, to the train method. Um, and so let's say the model code that you sent me for, uh, I think XD boost was really helpful. Um, I'll find, uh, the tests written for, uh, similar models in the GitHub repo as well. Right. Uh, yes, you're gonna, I mean, yeah, everything is within the same GitHub repo. Yeah, so all of the models reside under the same repo, which is, you know, this guy. And all of them yeah. are within model. So, all right. Um, all right, so this needs to be completed. Um, uh, then, um, so uh, list command uh, is good example. Um, all right. So, and let me just one second here. So you're going to want to do, you're basically going to want to make it. So actually you might want to do the meta class here. That might be helpful. So let's see. Yeah, you're, 
the thing is that okay what is going on here all right so you're going to run into some of the the ancient config handling code that's been around for a long time um and uh, that's all this args and config and get args and all of this stuff. So when this class, this class is instantiated. Um, now, where is it? So it's in DFFML util um, CLI. Um, was it parser? Yeah, parser. Um, and it's, yeah, list action. So, So let's see, where is that? So I think, yeah, list action, action equals list action. So, yeah, okay, so action. So basically there's this system where this uh, the config stuff works like this. So we have these config classes and then, and those are basically data classes. It's a it's a wrapper on top of data classes, um, which is a Python module in the standard library. Um, and so, you we take data classes and we turn them into basically these dictionary objects, um, which we have this abstraction called arg because it's an argument. Um, and the argument, so the arg classes describe to us. You know what is this property in the in in this config object? Um, so we go through and we do mkarg for each field um, in the data class, um, which is that config object. Um, and it goes through and you'll see so default factory. I think we talked about default factory last week. So default default factory, and it it provides an extra layer of abstraction up on top of that um, on top of the data class fields. Um, and oh here we go so here is the thing where it does okay if this you know it goes and it says okay if this is a class right and that class is a user list right so that would be you know the sources thing that we're looking at right then we go in and, and we set this part of this stuff is about arg parse and, and making sure that they, um, we can pass all this stuff to arg parse to parse these on the command line, right? So we go look at and we see if it has the singleton, right? And we create the action for it. So this is an arg parse action, and then we create the type. Now the thing is with the arg parse action, what that's doing is it's taking. So the arg parse action is saying. When you when when you see and you can read more about arg parse in the standard library too, right? So we say n args equals plus, which means that we're going to have a list here. So when you say when arg parse sees sources, it should expect to see multiple arguments following that before the next argument or before the next flag, which is something with the um, you know a hyphen in front of it, right? So it's going to see one equals CSV and two equals CSV, and it's going to go okay. Those are um, those are for this sources argument. So when we come in here and we, so it's gonna, the first thing it does it is it executes the action that's assigned to it. And we told it that this is the action for it is a list action. And so what, we, what that means is it's gonna call this class here, which is this arg parse action class. And it's gonna come in and it's gonna say, um, you know, what are the values and you know, what what are all the stuff that I'm, this is, this is your chance to do initial modification to this um, and the initial modification that we do is basically we just say okay if it's one, if there's only was one of these it ends up actually just passing you um, a single value instead of a list so we put it into a list and then we instantiate this class right so the problem that you're going to run into immediately is that you don't have access to any of the other variables at this point right you only have access to and you you may have access to them in this namespace, but that's not really a given because you don't know what order these things run in. Um, you may have access to them to in, in the parser or in the namespace, but to, I wouldn't I wouldn't count on that. Um, so you're going to look at this. Um, you're going to instantiate this list class here, right? Which is sources, because we basically said what's the type, and the type is sources. Right, so it instantiates the class here, which means that it's not going to be able to create the config object um, at the same time 
um, it's not going to be able to create the config object that contains, you know, the no merge, right? It's going to initialize it to its default value, um, which is going to be false, right? So you're going to need to go in at a later time, and that later time is essentially, um, so uh, let's see. So you you may need to add, let's see. So yeah, you're going to need to go in at a later time and specify and add those properties back to that class. Um, and this is going to get, I mean, it's going to get a little tricky here. So uh, where is that? Um, so that is, where's the parse unknown? Or let's see. Yeah, you may want to do, so Shock Chum, help me remember here. So basically, we do all the add arguments, I think, happen in command, right? So util CLI command, um, it's, yeah, here, right? So we go through and we add arguments to the arg, and this is standard arg parse stuff, so. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so we're doing this add argument, right? And we're using those arg, let's see, yeah, we're actually using the field classes right here. But, um, so, yeah, this is where, this is where we're doing the, the add arg stuff, or add argument stuff, right? So this is where sources gets added to the argument parser. Now, what you're probably going to want to do is in here somewhere so add argument yeah okay so there is basically these are the three places where this is happening i believe so you're probably going to want to uh if you run into or if the field uh which you are adding is a collections dot user list um, so similar to in mkarg uh, in dffml slash base dot py, um, you'll want to add each um, property of its config um, as well. Um, and let's see, is that going to be the best way to do it? Um, maybe, maybe not. No, you may want to grab these from parse unused. Let's see. So, yeah, so, Sokshom, help me, help me think about this here. So I'm thinking if you add them... I think parse, I think adding them to parse might work better. Uh, to what? So there's basically there's two situations here. So if we add them to, yeah, okay. So I think we don't want to add them here. So if we add them here, basically they end up in, and where is that? Add subs, parse args. Okay, yeah. So if we add them in that in that spot, they'll end up in here in this args. Um, I think it's yeah, it's like an object. Um, or it's the name, It's this is the namespace. Um, this is the same thing here, um, which is why we're doing set at her. Um, so yeah, because in this case, self.dest is the string sources. So you're saying basically args, this is equivalent to args.sources equals list class and then expand the values. So if you do add args there, then you're gonna need to look within args here um, to um, to to for the extra arguments that are related to sources. Um, whereas if you do this, so basically this parse unknown handles everything that's these multi levels deep. Um, and so this is probably a better place to look for the arguments because um, we need to we need to make sure that this stuff can happen like even if this sources class is nested down 
below other classes. Um, for example, with the data flow preprocessing source, if you were to nest it under there, um, you'd need to make sure that that it doesn't, you know, it still picks up these keyword arguments, even though that's not a top level on the command line. Um, so that where these come in is in, in this parse unknown. Um, and and, uh, and so basically all of that ends up in this extra config, which is a, um, it's a, let's see, where's that? I think we have the config format documented. Um, it's documented. Let's see. Uh, do you remember where that went, Sakshom? Or here. This is where the con or no, not quite, I guess. Yeah, no, it is. This is what it ends up looking like. Um, so, and this is only one level deep, unfortunately, so it's not the best example. But there's some more examples in the test. They're in test cases. I test think. cases, yeah. So, let's see if I'm test. Um, Where is it? Yes, here. This is a good parse unknown. Okay. So yeah, if you look in, in where is this? Test util, test CLI, parse unknown. Um, you'll see this giant structure, which is basically, you know, if you have something like this, um, this becomes plugin here, and then under it, so things like this, right? This gets nested under config, and then whenever you have an actual argument, it gets called plugin. Um, and yeah. Um, and that's because usually we're loading, we may be loading a plugin by that name, which would be something that's an entry point. Um, otherwise, we treat it as an argument to something like, otherwise, we treat it as an argument to, you know, like the config structure, right? So that's what we're going to be doing is basically we'll go in, we, we have parse unknown, we'll, we'll grab all this stuff and put it in extra config in that format, um, in this format extra config ends up looking like this, right? And so now what we need to do is we need to go through and we need to look at, um, let's see, we need to look at, there's places where extra config gets, um, let's see, with config. So the top level ones are considered to be instantiated, um, but they should have hit with config somewhere. Um, so let's see what happens here. Yeah. So basically it goes, it does parse args and I think that, so that does add argument and then that ends up with us in base again. And we do with config in here. Yeah. With config. Um, so well, where is this? Yeah, this is the base class, base configurable. So basically, when things get instantiated, and where's the other with configs? Yeah, from dict. So thing, when things get instantiated that are base configurables, they hit this with config method. And that basically ends up passing them that extra, um, uh, what is it, extra config um, that we just saw coming from parse unknowns that is in this format, right? So, but that's, that's that's if they haven't been instantiated already. Now the issue that you're going to hit is that basically this guy is instantiated. It's an instantiated object, right? So what you need to do is you need to come in and say, um, you need to come in and say, actually, yeah, you need to come in and say, okay, it's been instantiated, but it's a collections user list. Therefore, I need to go populate its config properties from the extra config, which is basically, um, it's, it's coming through, um, let's see, well, in places where you see things being instantiated with with config, see this says if it's a class, you need another block that says if it's an instance of collections user list. Um, and then you need to go through and you need to say, okay, well now let me cycle through all of the properties of that and, and instantiate them. Um, and that's, that's basically how you're going to 
end up fixing this problem. Now, there was a lot of background and a lot of information there, which is which is why this is recorded. <laughs> um, uh, but if you're up for it, then you you, you hopefully have some background on, on how you would fix it now. So, all right, any any questions on that? I know there was a lot of information there. Uh, I'll, pro I'll probably have to go through this again, but uh, yeah. I'll try and see what I can do. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, yeah, I, I would I would assume there will be rewatchings of this um, if you try to do that because obviously we haven't done it since January. So, and it, there was a reason we haven't done it. It's it's not easy. So, if you feel like doing it, um, you you hopefully that gives you a path there. Um, but uh, yes, it's definitely. Um, if you don't feel like doing it, no one will no one will blame you. Um, we we may need to do some more. Um, there may need to be some more work done on config stuff because um, some of it right now is not, um, uh, we have a large amount of code that deals with configuration and uh, it may need to get sort of refactored into, um, Sakshom got it all to the point where we can now use everything the same. Now we need to go through and probably look at um, where certain code paths are different because we have some some code that seems is, is a bit it seems like we have some duplicated functionality in different places without the code base that might in make this a easier to solve issue if we put it off till later. Um, but that's sort of been why it keeps getting put off too. So it may just be good to just go do it. Um, but either way, now you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Um, well, that was a very long explanation there. So, um, so is there a way? To, okay. Yeah, I'd um, recommend you to watch this uh, recording multiple times. I also watched it multiple times. Then I was able to understand everything completely. There's, yeah, there's just so much. The, the thing is that so much of, the, yes, this project is about, you know, abstracting machine learning, but, you know, how do you end up abstracting things is by making sure that you configure them all in similar, you know, in, in standard ways. And so there's a, a lot of the code base in the main library has to do with config. Um, so that was probably the most challenging part. Yeah. Of the, one of the issues I've solved. Let's see. Yeah, it's definitely the most challenging part of the code base. <laughs> um, let's see. So, okay. So we covered this in the meeting. Um, there's a lot of info c recording for more details all right um all right anything else you wanted to touch on today um shaw uh no uh it's not really urgent but um uh, i was having some trouble taking in that float argument uh from the config uh, part, but I don't think I need to do it right now. We can maybe do it later. Okay. Um, yeah. If and if you can post, if you can send us like a link to your work or something, that really helps. Um, like, and yeah. if some people post screenshots, it's a frequent thing. Um, but it's it's definitely easier from a review perspective to go in and see the whole a whole code base. Um, so if you have like a link to a branch or something, that's always really helpful. Um, and we can just maybe, yeah. uh, you know, point you in the right direction from Either there. Either way, um, I'll, send, I'll send a link to, uh, to the GitHub repo or uh, I'll try and make a pull request once the test cases are complete. All right, cool. That sounds good. All right, great. Um, so um, let's see. Um, uh, it was, uh, um, sorry, remind me of your name again. Our, our... Yeah, Nitesh. 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 Okay, I just want to make sure. I don't want to, I don't want to say anybody's name wrong. Um, Nitesh. Mm. Okay, Nitesh. Um, all right, so, uh, Nitesh, you've been, uh, let's see, let me just get, so you've been doing... Um, oh, you were trying to train the PyTorch model. So I think that yeah. um, I think that what might be going on here is that um, you are looking at uh, maybe the current release of things, um, and you probably want to look at 
the um, dock <laughs> for the master branch. Um, so, and that would be so anything with with slash master in it. And we just updated the uh, contributing docs actually um, to say this. So there's two versions of this documentation. Basically, as soon as you do a git clone. And you, you know, you want to work on the development version of things. And so, if you, I'm assuming you're, you know, you're, you're hoping to to do some contributions, um, then you want to be following uh, basically this version of the docs. And you're going to want to be doing, um, you're going to be wanting to uninstall anything that you have installed because that would have installed the, the, um, that would have installed like the the latest release of things. And if you're installing, let's see, what is this? Yeah, this. You're not going to have this in the latest release. Um, this is only PyTorchNet stuff is only in the development version of things, um, which is probably what's going on there. Because uh, I see that this got installed not in development mode. Um, so if it's installed to the site packages directly, directory, it wasn't installed in development mode, um, which is probably what's going on. So you probably got the latest release of some packages and you want to be working on uh, the stuff from the Git repo. Does that sound like maybe okay. what happened, or? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, and uh, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, as 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 uh, I wanted to install the DFML and all these things. So, uh, is there any way to uh, write code uh, so that uh, we can update the Python? Because I think that's the one of the common mistake, uh, common uh, problem, and uh, uh, error of. Uh, <clears throat> that throws that uh, the the version of Python is not uh, uh, from above 3.7 like that. So we can write a code for that that it automatically updates the Python as well. Um, or so. You mean like if you don't have the correct version of Python, that it gives you the correct version when you install? Yeah. Mm, that something like. is something that I don't think we can do or well. So it's something, so nothing's impossible. The question is more whether we should do it. Um, and yeah. that is usually, I mean, I would say that is not, um, that's not really our place as a package um, to do that. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that this is a frequent cause of, um, of headache. Um, but unfortunately, some of those features that we rely on for async stuff um, are, are 3.7 and above. Um, now there yeah. may be some backfills. I've seen more and more, um, backfills for th certain things. So I think one of the main things that we use is async context manager. Um, actually that's another, um, context libs or a async context manager and async exit stack. And this is added in 3.7. I think that was the main thing that, that, um, that, that, pushed us over so we could look and see because I know I've seen a lot of things recently um, that are backfills or so uh, what is it called back back ports um, so uh, back ports um, and that could allow us to run on um, oh here we go um, this could allow us to oh maybe not um, okay, open issue, probably not. Um, so if we had, if there were some packages out there that, that, that provided backports, we could require those as dependencies on things like Python 3.6, and then we could support that, and that would probably be uh, the, the better path forward. Um, so, but it looks like these people haven't done that and i would bet that this is probably the place that would have done that if um if, if it was around um so yeah so so i don't know if i don't know if this is something that that it would be possible to support 3.6 um but yeah you're gonna have a it, it'll be it would be better to figure out what are the backport packages that are required to support 3.6 than to try to install um, new versions of Python for people. Um, because there's just many, you get into, you know, a whole different problem space there. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that people are going to need to, you know, make sure that they have configured things specifically to their systems. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, get started, um, you know, try to, try to get things installed. Um, from 
from the Git repo, and that's going to mean probably uninstalling the existing packages that you had. Um, and you may want to install to a virtual environment. You may just be able to go through. And I think the thing is that you're going to run into is is uninstalling all the pro packages properly because you've already done. I think uh, you've already done. Um, you've already installed multiple packages. Um, my guess is. Um, and you're going to need to, this example just shows uninstalled the FFML, but we need to probably, I think this came up recently, but we need to probably have a command that uninstalls all of the DFFML packages because pip doesn't let you do like a star. It doesn't let you do like DFFML star, um, which means that you're going to have some that are still lying around. Um, and the way that Python works is it will use an installed package over a package in development version um, every time, which is very annoying for us who are working on things, but um, I guess not. A, I'm not sure who that's not annoying for, but that's how it works. Um, so you're going to need to uninstall things if you've installed them not in development mode. Yeah, sure. Uh, all right, cool. Um, so any? did you have anything else you wanted to um, talk about? or else we're going to jump into Sakshams context capacity stuff. So, yeah, I think uh, uh, I think it's it's enough for me right now. Cool. And uh, it's been just 4 or 5 days for me to uh, read the code base of TFML, so I think it's it's enough for me for today, right? Cool. Cool. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, well, thanks. Um, and uh, just let us know. I mean, so, yeah, we're all on Gitter, and then we have this meeting every week, so where we can all just kind of sync up and talk um, in virtual yeah, sure. person. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so now we want to get into this need to specify context capacity from the command line. And so we were just talking about a million config things. So now now we know the back the backbone of all that. That was good primer for, for this. Um, so... Uh, do you have a branch, uh, Saksham, that we can pull? Uh, yes, I have a branch. I'll link it right now. Okay. have uh, linked it in the meeting chat all right okay yeah color exam colorization example all right cool that's i got to just grab that so i've added uh, i've added other stuff to for training if you want to try it out at another awesome. time um okay so this is another thing for anybody who hasn't seen this git log dash p is is my favorite thing because it helps us figure out what what changed in the code. Um, so, okay, operations. Okay, and preprocess. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so there's max context. Okay, um, max CTX. Okay, um, and this is in. Yeah, the orchestrator context config. Okay. So yeah, this is this is tricky because now we're we're in the config. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, my first thought here is like, does that need to be in the config uh, or in the context config, right? Um, so because I think the thing is, so an orchestrator context is per data flow. Yeah, it's in uh, DF. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Duh. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, memory. Yeah, memory. So I think this gets tricky because we haven't dealt with with the context. Um, oh, you know, I think we might have an easy solution for this, actually. So, yeah. Oh, this is... Okay, okay. So I feel like there's an easy solution to this, which is basically... 
Um, for a case like this where we instantiate a context, when we instantiate a context, um, where is it? Yeah, so we instantiate the context here, right? And um, so we end up with, um, you know, this object is the config for the context. And we should be, yeah, so here's context and here's call. So, yeah, and so, okay, if, inst if the, if it's an instance of a data flow, then we just create this. Otherwise, we pass the context itself. So in this case, I think it probably makes sense to add. So this is memory orchestrator config. So I think it probably makes sense to add the same property to here. Um, and then say, and we should probably make this like the default value here. Um, So I think if we just do this, um, uh, the default it shouldn't the default be none because we if oh if we yeah specify yeah none right because then yeah it's uh, I just uh, added the one thousand to show that it was running for this yeah yeah good 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 call um so yeah none okay so yeah I think. I think, yeah, because the rest of these are all, and then reuse. Should reuse really be none? Yeah, re, or no, reuse. Yeah, because if. Uh, in your patch, uh, you uh, you made some changes for yeah. that to work. Okay. Oh, yeah, I probably did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's um, about here. Yeah, it should be none. That sounds right. Um, So, yeah, because now basically what we could do is, is, you know, if you wanted. So if one instantiated a data flow here, right? So if in this instance, this data flow, right? If you gave it a data flow, so the only reason, the only time you're gonna give it a context is you're, if you're instantiating this from the Python API, right? In which case you would have made your own context object and you wouldn't be grabbing things from the command line, right? So if you are, doing this here, then we could basically just say, um, so kwargs.setDefault, default, default um, uh, max ctxs, and then we can say self dot, dot config dot max ctxs, right, and now this should basically, I mean, I think this should be as all we need here. And then we can just set max CTXS on the command line. Because every time it instantiates a data flow, or every time a data flow is instantiated, um, at least I think all the command line paths take this, take, take this um, path here where they say is instance data flow, right? So you should be able to just give max CTXS um, to memory orchestrator on the command line and it will um it'll propagate through because it'll say you know um it'll just override um does this make sense yeah it kind of makes sense like how it will just be a uh, dash max dash ctx yeah only remember we have got an issue right now where it's still underscores for things that aren't at the top level so it'll be max underscore ctxs um, okay, okay, okay. So basically, I think I think you're going to end up with. Do you have an example we can run here? Or? Yeah, uh, I've linked the example. Uh, I have the I added the files in the same okay. branch. Um, okay. You just Train. need to run train message. Great. All right. So I think. Probably want to run only upon epoch. Yeah, good good call. Uh, let's see. Oh, you. Uh, I think you. You'll need. Uh, you'll also need the images, right? Oh yeah, I'd need the images. Okay, but we can just basically check. Um, 
let's see i don't know yeah what's the question is do you have a folder with a few images do i have a folder with a few images um no i don't think i do um can i download these from somewhere or how how big yeah you can download the data set from kaggle okay um it's land yeah there's oh there's a there's an example in the issue 910 i think 910 oh, okay great Thanks. Yeah, where you can download the images. Oh, that's for yeah. Oh yeah, would these images work for just throwing it through? Maybe this will. What do you think? Uh, no, uh, no. The, these are labeled uh, uh, labeled directories, right? Oh okay. yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, you can just I I think you can take that and just give the label directory single label directly like. Oh wait, but I don't need I don't we don't need this to to test it. We can just run we can just run any command. I mean, let's see. We should be able to run um we should be able to run just the command line data flow example here. Um yeah, we should be able to run this and see if it see if it propagated through. So um cuz this isn't I mean, it's not dependent on what what your um sort of a, a separate issue, right? Um, yeah. All right, so all right, so and then so we create the data flow, and now we run the data flow. Um, and what we would need to do is specify. Um, so, uh, this is a really long one. So it's, um, let me just make sure that we're actually going to pick this up here. So diff of ML data flow run context orchestrator. Okay. So it does get the orchestrator. So orchestrator, uh, max CTXS. Oh no, it's not. Um, let's just put uh, 42, and then let's um, let's see when we oh it should log when we instantiate the orchestrator context. Let's see here. So, uh, how will this work with if I'm running the train command? You should just be able to put orchestrator max ctxs 42, and it should it should pick it up. Um, yeah, max CTXS 42. So let's see, orchestrator config. Are we logging on creation of the orchestrator context config? Or orchestrator context, orchestrator context, orchestrator context, initializing data flow. Oh, I think we have overridden the, the print on that one. That's probably what's going on. So let's just come in. Here and do DF of ML, DF uh, memory. Uh, so we'll just say DF of ML train and then we'll uh, give dash orchestrator dash uh, max CTX. Uh, yes. So, and that should, because basically, you know, so what we did here was say, Okay, if you get a data flow, right? So if you if this thing has been passed a memory orchestrator context when we initialize, so when we do that that one two pattern of async uh, with orchestra, you know, memory orchestrator um, as orchestrator, and then I like I have written like uh, dffml train dash h, but yeah there's no dash orchestrator optional argument oh because because well because you're talking about you you're talking about the data flow preprocessing source right so because you're giving I'm this to, talking about the training yeah well i i know you're talking about the training but look at your your train command right so your train command is your train command is is the data flow preprocessing source Right, so it's taking the data flow here, right? So if you looked at, you know, if we look at the plugin docs 
for the data flow preprocessing source. It takes orchestrator. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. I haven't seen the change. Yeah. Was this the change of the mansion you made? I made this change at some point because it was a performance thing. Um, yeah, when, when was that? Um, but yeah, so basically. So it'll be dash source, dash orchestrator. Okay, okay. Yeah. I get it now. Yeah, so. Hmm. Let's see, no strict inputs. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not entirely important when it happened, but yeah, basically we, at some point we, we allowed for the orchestrator to be specified. Okay, here it was. Um, yeah, create, oh, by creating orchestrator context within the source context, we'll get about a 6x speed up. So yeah, so it basically just does, you know, it, it, we added this property to the class, right? And so basically all you're going to have to do is say, um, um, source orchestrator, um, and then max, and then this is where the weirdness comes in underscore CTX, um, okay. and then that should do it. Um, so, and then I think we were going to do one more invocation of this command just to make sure that the that the um, what happened with the where's the yeah run context where's that print yeah okay so yes it did get it so the context config it does propagate that that context um, the max context Hey, that's great news. That was a much easier fix than our other config um, situation. So, yeah. yeah, so that is your patch for that. Um, and I'll just do. Also, like, uh, I still, uh, I'm still confused. Like, why are we having two configs with the same uh, max UTX? Because... Okay, so the thing is that this one, so the thing is that when we have a, a context, what? This is for, this is the context config. Yeah, there's the context config and then there's the orchestrator config. And the context, the orchestrator context is tied to a data flow, specific, is tied to a specific data flow, whereas the orchestrator is not tied to any specific data flow. Um, oh. You know, you create instances of the orchestrator context every time you want to run a data flow, right? So we, we're basically saying, you know, what we're doing here is we're saying, here's the, con here's the config for the orchestrator and here's the config for the orchestrator context, right? And by default in the class definition, you know, if you were to instantiate this class, it's going to be instantiated with this parameter set to none, right? Um, which means don't, don't cap the context. Um, so now if we specify it within when we create the orchestrator, what this will do is say, if you created a data flow and you didn't pass me an explicit context for the, for the, or if you're creating a orchestrator context to run a data flow and you only pass the data flow and it was going to create an orchestrator context config for that data flow, then it's going to set the max context to whatever you specified for the orchestrator. So you're basically saying, hey, if you specify max context, you're going to, it's saying, if I create any data flows, right, or if I create any orchestrator context to run data flows, I want you to set the max context if you're, if it hasn't been explicitly set, right? Okay. Um, so I'll post this patch. Um, I'll just post this in Gitter. Does that make sense or, or is, are things still a little bit unclear? Yeah, it makes sense though. Okay, cool. Oops. God damn All it. that's left now is to just write the tutorial. Yeah, sweet. Very exciting. Okay. Um, 
Okay, this is great. Um, so I'm glad we figured that one out. Uh, it didn't take as much explanation into the whole config infrastructure, but at least um, hopefully for those who hadn't seen it, there was more um, more background on on why that change. This is this is why that config so code is so hard is because um, you know that was a pretty simple change there, right? Um, and we can go multiple levels. We saw we talked about how um, you know. In Sakshams case, he actually wants to set it within the data flow preprocessing source, right? So that really just becomes, or oh, this was the other thing. That really just becomes um, source dash orchestra dash max ctx, right? And and so that's that was the main, you know, this is why there's so much config code is because you can change this, and then this is what's required to propagate it to the config property of a different within a different class, right? And that's why, um, Sha, when you go to change things, um, you know, you're going to need to make sure that it doesn't just apply to the top level um, uh, class because there's some discrepancy in there um, with some of the code and which is why I was saying, you know, there's some cleanup to be done on the whole thing. Um, but yeah, um, anyways, okay, a lot of config stuff today. So how do you like uh, beautify this command line uh, command? this command yeah um so that is where is it all right so if you have um if i'm in vim or so if you have regex if you can do find and replace with regex which most things can um basically what i this is the this is the regex that you use um uh to beautify Uh, um, command line. Uh, thanks. So to beautify commands is basically. So, and what this does is basically say, okay, search for anything where you see a space with a hyphen and then turn that into a backslash um and control or and and for some reason in vim at least it's it's carriage return ends up actually producing a new line um and if you do a new line it doesn't actually produce a new line so so um oh. so yeah you just you're basically saying okay every time you see a space with a hyphen make that into a backslash and then a new line, and then however many spaces you want, and then add the hyphen again, um, which is what's going on here. So the space, okay. a backslash, which is double escaped, and then a new line, which is actually carriage return, so slash r, backslash r, and then space, and then a then hyphen, because we we got rid of the hyphen, so we need to add it back. I tried uh, giving a hand in uh, regex, but got a little intimidated. Yeah. So I it's, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I have a really hard time with, that's one of the things I really want to learn. So if you are on the command line, um, then this becomes um, SED dash I, oops. And then this, um, so if you don't use Vim and you just have the command line, or maybe you can put this into like um, VS code, find and replace, so. Okay, so now if we do Nope. Okay. Yeah. So if you're doing this on the command line, then you want to do dash n. And so I guess it's just vim that, um, yeah, it's just vim that has the weirdness with the R. So let me just do that. Um, so, or dash R if in vim. That's, I see. I have no idea why they do that, but they do. So. All right. Um, anything else from anyone? Or if not, then we will call this meeting wrapped up and we will convene next week. Um, so I know this is long. Um, thanks for thanks for sticking in there, everybody. Um, uh, we, I think we covered a lot of good stuff. So, all right. Thanks, everyone, and have a good one. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.